So you're telling me the British are just forcibly conscripting our soldiers from our boats for their army and hurting our trade for their ongoing war with France? Yes, and we would really like to expand our territory too. Well, if that isn't a good reason for going to war with the British, I don't know what is. Well... Welcome to the early 19th century, a time of powdered wigs, fancy dresses, and tension. The British and French were playing the My Navy's Bigger Than Yours game. Mine is bigger! No, mine! Oh, I thought we were talking about navies. And the poor neutral United States found itself stuck in the middle, watching its economy sink faster than a ship with holes. You see, both European powers imposed restrictions trying to hurt each other's trade and economy. Kind of like putting giant stop signs in the middle of the sea. Well, at least we Americans are neutral and can just make our money without any problems. Ever heard of impressment? No? Impress now? Welcome to the Royal Navy, mate. The Royal Navy, grappling with a sailor shortage due to the ongoing Napoleonic War, just forcibly conscripted American soldiers directly from their vessels under the practice of impressment. And then there were the British orders in council. Basically, they said, you can't trade with Napoleon. In fact, no one can trade with Napoleon. And Napoleon, meanwhile, was like, Bonjour, you, my friend, can't trade with the British. In fact, no one can trade with the British. So you see, despite America being neutral, their own trade was significantly hampered. But who will buy my Gucci bags now? With all these shenanigans, American anger was starting to boil over. So the United States tried a series of, let's say, innovative legislative moves to deal with Europe's nonsense. First up, the Embargo Act of 1807. There, if Europe wants to play games, we simply won't trade with anyone. Wait, so we're hurting ourselves? Unsurprisingly, this act quickly backfired. Instead of Europe crying, it was America's economy that went down the drain. But they didn't stop there. Ladies and gentlemen, well, or rather, just gentlemen, I am introducing the Non-Intercourse Act. We'll trade, but just not with Britain and France. And guess how that went. But then the Americans thought to themselves they'd give it a third try. The new bill basically said, Hey, first one between Britain and France to play nice gets exclusive US trade. Sounds tempting, right? Neither the British nor the French were too excited about this offer. And so the US kept facing one diplomatic challenge after another. So while all this trade limbo was happening, out west, another dance was underway. And it wasn't exactly the cha-cha. As American settlers went west, they were met by Native American tribes, and they were like, Oh, actually, this is our land. Meet the leaders of one of these tribes, to come say in his bro, Tenskowatala. Leading the Shawnee, they were not exactly fans of American expansion. But guess who suspected of sneakily handing out weapons and support to these tribes from the sideline? Yep. Good old Great Britain, making friends all over the place. So now America had not one, but two beefs with Britain. The pot was about to overflow. And inside these halls of the US Congress, a group was forming with a not so subtle name, the War Hawks. We need to defend American honor. Enough of this British bully. And maybe, just maybe, grab some land while we're at it. Because when you're mad, why not shop for territories as well? Canada and Florida seemed pretty appealing on America's shopping list. But what really stirred the pot? The Chesapeake Leopard Affair. The British warship HMS Leopard brazenly attacked the USS Chesapeake off Virginia's coast. By 1812, you can imagine a pressure cooker. Now imagine that pressure cooker on fire. That was the US. With their pride wounded, territories eyed, and too many ships and unsolicited quarrels, the U.S. did what any sane entity would do. Declare war on Great Britain. So the U.S., full of vim and vigor, thought, Hey, let's just start by invading Canada. That'll show the Brits. Meanwhile, at Fort Mackinac on July 17, 1812, British forces aided by the Native American allies launched a surprise attack. What? When do we get British neighbors? The American commandant, Lieutenant Porter Hanks, was unaware that war had even been declared, so the garrison was completely unprepared. Recognizing the vulnerability of his position and fearing a massacre if he resisted, Hanks surrendered without a fight. And so, for the U.S., the war wasn't exactly off to a roaring start. Just when the Americans thought it couldn't get worse than Fort Mackinac, the calendar turned to August 15, 1812. We entered the Battle of Detroit. The stage was set. 
On the one side, we have the American forces, led by Brigadier General William Hall, and on the other side, the British forces, led by Major General Isaac Brock, with support from the Native American leader Tecumseh. But instead of an epic showdown, it was more like a non-showdown. That's a lot of troops. Is that Tecumseh? Surprise! Oh, and he brought his friends too. Hull was less afraid of the British and more terrified of the idea of being mass massacred by the natives. So instead of an action-packed confrontation, Brigadier General William Hull opted to surrender Detroit. For the Americans, it wasn't just a defeat, it was yet another facepalm-worthy moment. Now it's October 13, 1812. The US thought, if we can't win in Detroit, let's try again, in Canada. And so US forces attempt to cross the Niagara River and invade Upper Canada. And the Americans initially even took Quinston Heights, until they struck a similar face again. They faced off against none other than Major General Isaac Brock, again. But fate had other plans for Brock. And just as things got heated, Brock got, well, downed. <sighs> My heart hurts! I feel like I'm having a heart attack! Come on, Brock, it's not that bad. You just have been hit by a bullet. <laughs> and so, Major General Roger Schaefe took over the troops, launched a counterattack, and before you knew it, the Americans were in full on retreat mode. Queenston Heights was not the American conquest they'd hoped for. Instead, it was yet another retreat. Then, in January 18, 1813, the U.S., perhaps inspired by a New Year's resolution, took the fight to Frenchtown. This engagement began as a successful American push against a smaller British force and its Native American allies. See, we've got the upper hand this time. Yeah, what could possibly go wrong? Famous last words. Just as the Americans started dreaming of victory, the British and Native American forces said, Hold my tea and tomahawk. The British and Native American counterattack a few days later resulted in a significant American defeat. And while the British captured a lot of Americans, they made an oopsie. You're not just leaving us here, right? They promised they'd be nice. No need to worry. Spoiler alert, they weren't. And this whole incident led to the River Racing Massacre. The takeaway? Canada wasn't going to be the quick shopping spree the US thought it would be either. While land battles had their ups and downs, the US Navy was out to prove it wasn't just a fish out of the water. Who says size matters? On August 19, 1812, the USS Constitution and the HMS Guerrier went toe to toe. And despite the odds, the Americans delivered a knockout. American morale was now sky high. However, back on land, the British had big plans. They wanted a Native American buffer state in the Midwest. Our own space, away from American expansion? Sign me up! With you leading the charge, what could go wrong? Hmm, let's see. Their ambitions were soon put to the test, and the Battle of the Thames ensued in 1813. And Tecumseh's dream turned out more like a nightmare. Tecumseh was killed, and the dream of a buffer state went up in smoke with it. The British defeated Napoleon in Europe in 1814 and thought, hey, why not double down on America now? Their first stop was Washington, D.C. Let's redecorate this place a bit. And by redecorate, they meant burn everything down that was in their way. Next up was Baltimore. Their subsequent assault on the city was thwarted, with Fort McHenry withstanding a 25-hour bombardment by British forces. With Baltimore standing tall, up north, the Battle of Plattsburgh was heating up. On September 11, 1814, a British fleet led by Captain George Downey confronted the American naval forces under Master Commandant Thomas McDonough on Lake Champlain. Prepare to feel the might of the British fleet! You bet! McDonough's fancy footwork, or rather shipwork, allowed the American forces to gain the upper hand. The engagement was fierce, and both sides gave it their best. Sadly for the Brits, Downey met a cannonball that had his name on it. With their leader down and their ships worse for wear, the British waved the white flag. But the battle didn't just stop on the waters. On land, the Brits had numbers on their side. They were all set to run over the American defenses. The American defenses were led by Brigadier General Alexander Macomb. Remember, it's not the size that counts, it's how you use it. Yes, Macomb, you would know. And Macomb's men? They put up one heck of a fight. Saint Provence, bad news, we lost at sea. Wait, what? Without the lake, we're like fish out of water. Believing that control of the lake was essential for further operations, Provost thought that Canada was a lovely place after all, and quickly headed back home. This American victory wasn't just for the bragging rights, it was a game changer at the peace table. 
By Christmas Eve 1814, both sides were ready for a break, so they signed the Treaty of Ghent and said, War? What war? Boys, we've got British to beat. With snail mail being what it was back then, some folks didn't get the memo in time. And so, we enter the Battle of New Orleans, even after the war has officially ended, and Jackson's forces crush the British. Who needs a treaty when you've got victory? It says here the war's over? Well, the battle was a morale booster for the US, and Jackson, well, let's just say his resume got a shiny new bullet point. So there you have it, folks. The War of 1812 was over, but the aftermath of the war had profound implications for the young United States. They came out of it with a pep in their step. Against all odds, they'd stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the big British bully. The sense of unity, stronger than ever. As for the Federalists, it was not their best moment. Their war is bad motto, it went out of style faster than powdered wigs. The power of Native American coalitions was weakened, paving the way for more Western expansion, making room for, well, more Americans. In defense, let's just say America took go big or go home seriously. The young nation had learned, having some muscle doesn't hurt nobody. Well, except your enemies. Arguably a stance that the US still holds to this very day. I'd like to thank my subscribers on Patreon who make this content possible. A special thanks and shout out to Azure Refounded and Dulles. This type of content is pretty time consuming to produce. If you want to support my channel and help me create more of these videos, please consider subscribing to my Patreon under patreon.com slash history with Seth. As a thank you, subscribers receive exclusive behind the scenes content, early access to, and a shout out at the end of every video and decide what future videos should be about. So thank you for your support.